Namaste and in la catch and welcome to this episode of One World and New World. I'm your host Zen Benefiel and as always I'm going to extrapolate on the meanings of those two phrases. Namaste comes from the Sanskrit uh, India and it's spoken it's called Brahmi and it means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. In la catch comes from the other side of the world, the Mayan civilization, and it simply means I am another you. So think about that as you're greeting people daily and even looking at yourself in the mirror. Try those frames on as how you look at others and see what kind of difference it makes in your life. Don't believe me? Test it yourself. All right. So we've got a great guest this week. His name is Don Schmenke. And I hope I pronounced that right because I didn't ask beforehand. And he is uh, just a, a really vastly um, experienced gentleman. He's uh, the explorer and scientist and author who trained 15,000 CEOs to drive higher strategic performance and sales. That's just one of the things. Um, he has degrees from John Hopkins University. He's got a master de master's degree in human behavior and organizational administrative science. And he's also uh, a faculty at John Hopkins. Um, I believe there's another degree in there that I missed. And I apologize for that, but I'm sure you'll correct me. Um, what I'm fascinated with, he's been a speaker for the Young Presidents Organization. And what that means is he had to have been the president of the company that made 40 million before his 40th birthday. Uh, he's also the author of several books, including the Code of Executives, uh, the Code of the Executive, and High Altitude Leadership, as well as the. Uh, oh, I'm guessing that the. Uh, Continuation of the title of the first book is 47 Ancient Samurai Principles Essential for 21st Century Leadership Success. So perhaps we'll get to talk about that soon. Don, it's a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great. So, you know, we've talked a little bit beforehand uh, kind of where we're going. So what I attempt to do is, is to draw out personal experiences of how you found the bridge between the inner and outer lives that we live and how that first became evident to you that there was those two. So let's start there. How did that first take place where you had an inkling that there was something more to life than just the outer experience? Uh, I don't know. I think it's, uh, you know, when I was a young kid, my mother said that I was asking questions. I, I was looking at different things. She ended up um, introducing me to a, an organization that actually collected a lot of information around the world, some psychic, some religious, some uh, cultural. Um, and so I ended up um, being part of that. And and it really helped me as, as a child to get access to literature and searching and and um, the organization is called the association for research and alignment standard virginia beach so because she took your casey yeah exactly and yeah. i ended up being on the board there years many years later oh you probably was, know a good friend of mine then um his name and i'll patrick um oh gosh he's from phoenix um walsh oh you know i think Can i bring about yeah it's been, but it's been like 15 years or 20 years or so yeah, yeah. I, I know the name I'm trying to picture the face but anyway the um yeah so I did that and then that um that was that was an area and my my whole life I was really sort of um at that time uh struggling with some things I ended up uh almost dropping out of high school and I until the police told me that I I had to repeat my senior year and I'm like, there's no freaking way I'm going to stay here for another year. And I said, what do I got to do? And they said, well, you got to do a whole year within the next 90 days or something. And um, I said, fine, let's do it. And so, and the teachers are really supportive and I, I was pretty motivated. I actually did the entire year within, you know, 90 days. And so I did graduate. Um, and and then I, you know, I was in rock bands at the time and it was, I was just wandering and certainly I was exploring Eastern philosophies and 
And a lot of this was during like, you know, the Woodstock era. So it was easy to get mm -hmm. around people that were also exploring this new thing. Sure. And um, yeah, so uh, I was working at my uncle's gas station and I noticed that a lot of the guys with the fancy cars had an education. So I thought, well, you know what? I, I don't think I'm going to make money in rock bands. So <laughs> <laughs> some do but those are rare cases right exactly. I, I tried it too i was a drummer in a, a rock band i still play today oh cool cool i need to pick the guitar up again i yeah but i haven't that's good that you're still doing it i, I love it the uh, golf which is where i met pat uh, and drums are things that i've been doing since i was a teenager oh neat cool excellent well anyway what happened at that point i there was a community college up the street and i uh I thought, well, why don't I go there? And they really didn't care if I showed up or not, which I thought was interesting. You know, uh, it wasn't like I was going to have the police chasing me. It was like they right. got my money. So uh, I, I didn't need to show up if I wanted to waste the money on it. So I did, ended up um, really getting excited and got involved with um, various things that I just jumped around on, like computers and physics. And um, apparently... But do you find, as you're searching for something... Um, did you find that because of that early introduction to an expanded awareness that your passions spilled out over into multiple areas and that you actually spent some time with each one of them? I didn't notice it at the time. I was just um, curious. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was trying to understand you know, what all this meant. And, uh, but at the, all, at the same time in the real world, I had to figure out, well, how do I, I get a good job? <laughs> how am I going to survive, right? Or fun. more or less, how am I going to thrive really? Because yeah. that's, that's the optimal. Yeah. So I must've done something right. Cause I, you know, I got a couple of associate degrees, but, um, uh, I got really involved in student, like, student activities and the woman running it was from Boston, her husband from MIT. And then retired physics professor from MIT, I was also there, and they both said you should apply to MIT. And I'm like, I don't know. That's what the that one was. I missed. You're right. You know, right. <laughs> so I'm thinking, you know, was, what is that? Is that a trade school? I mean, I, I yeah, right, 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 right. Well, I actually but, took the uh, class with um, Otto Sharmer, uh, his uh, transforming business society and self. There were thirty-two thousand students worldwide in this series, yeah. and it was just phenomenal. A lot of these, a lot of these mega courses have um, been inspiring when you see the impact yeah. they're having. But I was there long before that. I had left uh, a long time ago. Sure. Where we, you know, had the internet and all that happening. So I, um, anyway, I got in and I was like, "Whoa, what do I do now?" But um, you know, the focuses weren't really in any one thing at a time. It was really multiple. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I was working in. Um, electrical engineering, computer science department. And so I was studying there and then I got, got bored. So I added uh, planetary sciences to that. Um, at the same time, I did my thesis uh, with the Harvard MIT Biomedical Engineering Lab. And then, um, and then I was designing, um, helping a small part, of just supporting a team, uh, designing the nuclear tried missile pro pro program. So I was in and out of a lot of different things. What was really good about it is I was able to integrate various themes, various sciences and engineering pro protocols. So my interest in humans came about around that time, <laughs> around that time. Oh, that sounds strange, interest in humans, but uh, hey, hey, hey. Well, I get it. I, I, I totally yeah. get it because that's kind of where we end up is once we get the, the smattering of the, the educational um, explorations, and, and the curiosities and things like that is it, okay now where do we make it practical and that comes back to the human dynamic and, and understanding humans better so that you can actually get those things to work yeah yeah and i it was it was a journey i didn't really expect because i um that's when i ended up at hopkins and i did my graduate work there mm -hmm. and i got fascinated with how humans organize and how we were evolving and so i ended up teaching there um Dr. Kathy Trow, before she went to Harvard to um, get involved with their the governance uh, leadership program, that they were really doing a great job pioneering. Um, she brought me in, and and I at that time I was 
working with a number of CEOs and I was finding their frustrations uh, with uh, management theory implementation. Uh, so she asked me, well, what would I do differently? And I designed something and she said, I'll teach it. I'm like, I love it. What time frame was this in? Oh, this was probably in like the early 80s, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. way before Senge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Long mm -hmm. before that. Okay. Um, I began to, uh, so I loved teaching. It was fabulous. But then um, Oxford University gave me um, a, a access, permission, copyright permission to uh, study and re-edit uh, re re one of their manuscripts that was an ancient um, samurai training program uh -huh. that uh, the, um, Dr. Al Sadler had translated about half a century ago. So I took that and I uh, wrote something called the Code of the Executive as just something to use in my classes because I was teaching in the graduate school at Johns Hopkins at the time. But then it took off into like, I don't know, 15 languages. The next thing I know, I'm being asked to speak and I'm like, what is going on here? But that that ended up catapulting me into a whole other area, which was uh, training CEOs. So, you know, that's how I ended up training you know, so many CEOs. I did Fascinating. That. Now, what did you find uh, going back into these ancient philosophies, right? And of course, it was called philosophies up to the 14th century before it came, became science. Uh, what did you find that, that resonated with you that really, that, the essence of it that you brought forth into being able to express it in the modern day as tools for transcendence of challenges and problems I took um I really took a team approach and I was just um blessed by being connected with a lot of brilliant people and so mm -hmm. uh you know combining anthropology and evolutionary genetics and and the new realm of evolutionary psychology um that Dr. David Buss pioneered when he was at Harvard in fact we've been chatting about maybe doing a book together at some point um, it was using their insights that helped me look at, you know, our species and how it evolved. And so it let me come up with models that we could test in companies. And, and what happened is the sales of these companies went up like two or three times, in some cases, 10 times within a few years. And, um, I guess the CEO, is that important? Because, yeah, that's pretty important. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Oh, and they just have to have the capacity to handle it, right? Oh, right. So I ended up um, self-funding all the research. So that led me to uh, every year I would take one or two expeditions into remote regions of the world to observe and learn from these various cultures and their various philosophies or uh, insights in life. And that gave me just a ton of work because we, you know, by, by filming and interviewing and just living, you know, in, in those environments over the next 15 or 20 years, I went, went through a number of, um, mm -hmm. fascinating experiences, but each time I brought stuff back to try to make a difference in organizations and leadership. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. Um, the stuff that worked, we ended up honing more and, um, so that's why a lot of the, the workshops I do now to teach mm -hmm. executives is a combination of, you know, 20, 30 years of research and expeditions and some brilliant minds that have uh, Sure. I, I had the opportunity to engage one of those brilliant minds as well. I, I was in the aerospace industry in the 80s as a, uh, started as a machinist and then became a production control uh, coordinator. So I was in charge of $7 million a month and the 800 part numbers that, for commercial spares. Um, but what I eventually did was I got them to agree that interpersonal skills classes were necessary. And I found a consultant, brought him in. And in that process, we developed a relationship. And he'd mentioned that in the 80s, when American companies were trying to get a foothold globally, the 80% of them failed because they didn't spend any time learning about the culture that they were going into. And right. so they tried to prescribe their culture in place of the existing culture and people just yeah. don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. So how did you find it in your research? How did you get beyond that? Was it just as simple as, Hey, you guys need to study the local cultures first, or were there some uh, golden threads that went throughout that, that were applicable? 
uh, I just went in uh, empty. You know, I, I whenever I, I to start. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these expeditions, I either um, was going in because I knew a team that was going into the area, so I hooked up with them, or I just picked a spot on the map and then just flew in. And but I, I always discovered something remarkable. Normally, when I was there, I would hire um, someone that like it may be an anthropologist or someone that was uh, embedded in the, in the culture, mm -hmm. uh, an academic or some researcher. And so that helped me, you know, get deeper, faster. Sure. And that way, because when I, when I hire these guys, it's like, some, like some of the regions that I want to go to are regions that have not been touched by, you know, Western presence. That's getting harder and harder to do uh, today. But um, I mean, a lot of the places I went to have hotels now. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, uh, that's, I can't go back there anymore. Right. You know, but I say, look, if I see, if I see a tour bus, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and, and those things are true. You know, we have um, spread our culture, not ubiquitously, but nearly so with the agendas that we've had to do so that in some ways are, are beneficial but I wonder, you know, in the long term, if they are so, because they've, it seems that because of that industrialization process, that we've actually harmed our environment and those kinds of, of people uh, more than we've helped. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, and there's some areas where they're still struggling with, like, one of the things I, I, I wanted to study in empires collapse, and I never had it. How do you do that, right? I mean, how many hmm. empires collapse? Right. So when the Soviet how you live to be a thousand years or even a few hundred? <laughs> right. Well, at the time, fortunately, um, the Soviet bloc was collapsing, and so hmm. I thought, here we go. Let's. And so I ended up uh, sneaking into um, th that area, and um, colorful story. I mean, I'm, I'm in Austria trying to find how to get through some communist checkpoint in Czechoslovakia <laughs> with a bright red capitalist off to a, was a Ford Escort. Right. And, uh, anyway, I, I, long story short, I got in, I was in Prague when it fell. Uh, so it was dangerous, obviously. I mean, you didn't know when the tanks were going to come in. Um, I tried to hang around with the journalists because I thought they would get shot last. And I just didn't, you know, and then, you know, they had, by the time I got to East Berlin, they had moved to Checkpoint Charlie. So I'm now lost and illegal and communist territory, but I learned so much, you know, I ended up learning so much from the people and my, I had my daughter Rowan, she went back into Prague and I, I, and I, um, I charged her for, for record, to record, I said, find somebody, anybody that's over 50 or 60 years old and ask them what was life like, what was changed. And she had some great recordings. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, is that people were crying? They were. It was emotional, and but I was there. I just wanted to see like how that that occurred. Now, so, did you find that you know this, let's say, protection that you had because obviously nothing happened? Were there um, things going on within you, thoughts, emotions, intellectualizations that got you through that? and or things that you noticed in the outer world that gave you doors to walk through that coincided with what was going on in your internal process? I think it was more synchronistic, you know, if we take a Jungian term, I think it's, I think there was, okay. um, if patterns would occur um, unplanned and yet very beneficial. And so, do you think it had something to do with your intention? Because partially what I've learned is that wherever you focus your attention, intention, and interaction, uh, magic happens, right? Kind of like yeah. what you're... Well, my intention clearly was, clearly was to learn. But in that whole dance of learning, I wasn't thinking about anything. Sure. It, it was when I look at the explorations, um, I might have been thinking about questions to ask, but as, as the journey unfolded, I didn't really, I didn't really step back and think of it objectively. In fact, looking back on some of these experiences, I was like, wow, what were you thinking? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you were in the moment, right? And, and I think that's yeah. an important um, 
piece to really look at is, you know, because most of the time humans, speaking of, they're in the past or the future creating fears that never happen, right? Which mm -hmm. eliminate the possibility for being in the present. Well, what it sounds like from what you're saying is that none of that existed with you, with the exception of a small window in the future, because you were thinking about what you were doing and who you could talk with, the questions you would ask, you're formulating things to prepare, which is a much more present time kind of event. Mm -hmm. You didn't have time to, to think about the others, which from my perspective really facilitates the synchronistic events. Yeah. Because yeah. you're in that place. And I'm sure that you've probably realized that, you know, in looking back and like you were saying, taking a, an observer point, kind of analyzing what you went through and looking at, oh yeah, well, Gosh, that was interesting, <laughs> right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, because you know, I, when you're in the domain of learning, you don't want to think. You know, because if you're thinking, it interferes with learning. Important, very important piece in, in the learning process, because most of the time, it seems anyway that we want to answer those questions with the thinking we already have or the knowledge that we think we have when in reality right. we need to ask the questions and just shut up yeah right. <laughs> that's right. and be in that open state and that's hard to be because that's an unknown and that's a really hard place for most people to go through just to let yeah. go and allow things to evolve in front of you or within you depending yeah yeah and that was really it i mean i uh I remember being somewhere once and there, um, somebody had these pictures, uh, and I was like, wow, gorgeous pictures. And the, these are pictures of, um, in the Himalayas and, and a lost civilization that we were mm. investigating. And it wouldn't happen to have been the Dropa by chance, would it? No, no, it was in okay. the, it was the Bhutanese territories, uh, okay. about 20 years ago when they started opening up their borders. So 40 of us got into the country. A dozen of us were on an expeditionary team, but I was like, "What well, great, great pictures! I, who took those shots?" And they said, "You did." <laughs> I was like, "Oh, you know, I totally, I totally uh, didn't remember." Of course, at the time, you know, people think that you know these exotic expeditions are sexy. It's like Indiana Jones. Who, oh, they're like, grueling. Yeah. Oh, they're horrible. I mean, I, I love Indiana Jones. It's like, he's my, I'm a wannabe Indiana Jones. <laughs> but I, uh, in fact, I, I, a friend of mine's uh, son-in-law won the award from Harrison Ford for the Indiana, Indiana Jones award. He's got some great stories. Oh, but cool. anyway, so, but when you're out there, you're right. It's what they don't show you is, yeah, I mean, you're exhausted. You're at altitude at 17,000 feet. You're, you're, you're going, I mean, you just, you're just spent. I mean, you're dehydrated, you're exhausted, you're, you haven't slept more than a few hours a night. You're, and so all this is going on in your body because the environment's changed and, and uh, sheer will is the only thing that's getting you through. Emotionally. Well, you know, people forget to mention about parasites. So I have, I always have friend relation relationships and I bring friends home with me. <laughs> um, you know, they just, uh, you know, it's like, there's a lot of stuff going on. Right. Uh, so it's not very comfortable sometimes. But it's, it's, I love doing it and I love learning from it, but I can say it's, that's a great, you know, it's a great, uh, wouldn't recommend it for people at home, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Don't do this at home. <laughs> yes. Well, and we, you know, we're getting the, the, what is, there's a show that's out on, uh, I think it's Netflix called Alone. Um, that chronicles people that are oh, sent into yeah. isolated areas and, and survivalists, right? And they're basically sharing their stories. And you can see just the, the horrible conditions that they have to navigate yeah. in order just to survive, let alone keep their sanity. Yeah. That's why it's best just to watch it on TV. Right, right. Well, you know, all those kinds of things. I think it's good for anyone to have an experience of the unknown that really kind of gives them a shock to the system. Mm -hmm where they're able to get out of themselves and, and their own head and just observe and reflect and, and ask questions. Because yeah. we don't do that. We don't, especially in, in conversations, like I'm sure you've recognized in your corporate work, that uh, especially in negotiations, you've got two people coming to the table with two different dictionaries that they're speaking and listening from, and it's their own, and they have <laughs> no idea what's going on with the other one. And until they right. do, then progress is made. 
Yeah, yeah. And I think that's important. I think we don't, it's an area that I've been exploring in my personal life is that, uh, cause I've, I've made a series of mistakes where I began to learn that when you're having a relationship, it's nice if you agree, if you both agree on what the relationship is. And we never take the time. To that's kind of important. <laughs> it's like, we assume that they're having the same relationship that I'm having uh because why wouldn't it i mean this is like happening but on the other side it's a whole different world and they're thinking the same thing but you don't realize that where you're in two different areas and and usually in areas of conflict then it 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 shows up and so then you're like wow how come it end up harmony in the world because i think a lot of us are just having two different conversations (laughs) absolutely and i think that's the the core is that when those issues come up, we tend to deflect, deny, divert, do everything that we can to avoid dealing with them. And Mm -hmm. then when we start speaking from a heart-centered place and and being genuine, authentic, uh, raw in some cases, because we've never been able to do this before. So we're talking about stuff that we've never been able to talk about. And we're sharing it with someone that we really care about. So we want them not to have the misunderstanding of your intentions or or your want of creating a harmony in the relationship and that's often a a tough thing to get through but once you start once those few uncomfortable conversations happen then it begins to give you the opportunity to have more and go deeper in in peeling back the layers of, of those differences so that you can find some kind of agreement even if you choose to disagree yeah right and that's um that's useful in all kind of levels in fact a lot of the work we do in organizations is um like somebody was asking me just a couple days ago like how how can i get my my teams and being disruptive they're not uh coming together they're you know what what do i what do i do what does this mean and and it's like well they haven't learned how to die properly right they're like what that's like and not in any management textbook there's not in any training or development in it. but it's 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 like that's what we discovered and especially in the ancient samurai work how, yeah, they, how do you they, die to self yeah you know it's so it's in all the monasteries right it's in all the mystic religions but when it comes to an mba program it's like uh what right. but it actually works there very very hopefully so that so the suicide ritual is um even though the samurai are known for their physical suicide rituals it was merely the suicide of the ego Mm -hmm. and so i think that journey of committing suicide a thousand times a day to our ego allows us to to learn and be present to who this other person is sure and the ego turns into we go as a result right because it creates that bonding agent that wasn't there before because you've gotten yourself out of the way and and made yourself available to have that communion yeah right yes now you can explore yeah it's a fascinating process you have to set it up so so that you can actually you know you set the work up and then you do the work Uh, and that can be excruciating for some that haven't had that opportunity to examine self to that depth right yeah it's hard you know giving up letting die what you want to have live is difficult right now do you find that in reflection to what i said earlier about being in the present moment do you find that in that process that these things that they're dying to are uh, past events and and regrets or or, um, judgments and or future concerns you know, all, yeah, we, we try to categorize like, well, what would that be? And it ended up about 25 years ago, the model that we ended up with is it's their beliefs. And I, everything you said falls under a belief. It's a belief right. about it. Right. And so that seemed to be the best comprehensive categorization is no matter what it is, it's coming from a belief that's driving this behavior. Sure. So there's so belief systems everything. there. How did you then advance that into experience systems that are more reliable i well, first it was easier to, it was easy to come up with okay what are the main issues that are dysfunctional in other words behaviors that don't work in your life 
Right. And then have the group come up with, okay, what would it look like if you were a high performance, high leadership, you know, highly effective team? And then there's a whole nother set of issues. Right. And, and you got so, the Delta. Yeah. You got the Delta and it's like, okay, what are the beliefs driving this? What are the beliefs driving that? Now, what we ended up doing, it was a total failure is typically, you know, consultants are like, well, you're from here, you got to get to there. What's the action plan? And we'll move from here to there. And the failure rates are very high with that model. So I had to figure out like, what, how do we, you can't just say I'm changing my belief today and it changed. It's just not going to happen for it doesn't want to die. And that belief knows exactly how to use you to stay alive. Right. right. So it was in the samurai research when I wrote the code of the executive that something came out that was so politically incorrect that went against the grain that was so, um, I don't know, it violated what we think to be, you know, our kinder, gentler selves. I thought this is perfect. This has got to work. <laughs> and, and it was, a, what they described is that the unborn brave, you know, the, the, the uh, coward could be made brave if they had, and this is, we think, well, more self-esteem, right? You know, self-esteem movement, which has been one of the most, disastrous uh, collapses of, of an experiment is th 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 just failures of an experiment of this self-esteem movement and the data right. is not out on that kind of evolved into the uh, oh what do they call it the the generation of the uh, the expectations that they have the the entitlement generation that's the word i'm thinking yeah, of. yeah right. exactly and um so i'm actually doing a section i'm running a book on entrepreneurship and I'm actually have a section in there because it had it has to do with demystifying or myth busting what we know to be true. And so this there and the thing is, is it is it is it really entitlement? But I'm hearing some questions, is it, or is it really fear of being responsible? Because I've never had to do that before. And uh, you know, so there's interesting Key factor, I, absolutely. I about that. So I'm I'm st starting to explore that more. But in the in the samurai thing, it wasn't this person needs to have more self-esteem to be braver. It was, they need to have more shame. Hmm. We don't teach shame, you know, but what I found and like, you know, I had, I had been, I connected with a lot of people who uh, done some, you know, out of like some of the top penitentiaries, <laughs> a lot of convicts. And I was always impressed at the high level of self-esteem they had. Hmm. It's just they didn't have shame. So this samurai technique was that you would put the unborn brave, the coward, and make sure that they were too ashamed to turn and run in front of their colleagues. And if they were too ashamed to well, turn and run, pressure there, huh? they go into battle. Right. What they found out is that after a few battles, you couldn't tell the difference between the brave and the unborn brave. And it was shame that allowed bravery to occur. So how do we come back to this? You got to get from, from, you know, the, 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 the you got to get, go from your current state of dysfunction to a new state of, dis, a new state of functional beliefs. So these beliefs must die. These beliefs need to be born. Guess what's going to have to happen? Pain mm -hmm. and suffering and death. Right. Cause you want to, you're in process of making your mind the master rather than the slave with different thoughts that you're feeding it and that just is so disruptive and painful because you're you know you're basically destroying your life and and what you believe to date suicide and so yeah. basically what we do is we tell the groups don't do it stay where you are it's going to take too much to get mm. there and it's interesting because when people realize that the bravery rises up you know, I've heard it that courage is fear that said its prayers. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's it's just the bravery rises up, and and people want to take on that challenge. I'm willing to suffer, and I'm willing to sacrifice for the greater cause. And that's what we don't teach anymore today. And and well, I mean, we do in our leadership training mm -hmm. that suffer, sacrifice are missed elements that we need to have. Right. Yeah, we're, we're striving for enlightenment now in the drive-through, mm -hmm. 
right? Yeah. Or at least in Western civilization. No, it's true. It's true. But if you look at any of the ancient philosophers or mystics, they didn't have like a real happy life. Like this was great. I just had so much fun achieving epiphany. No, no it's usually a lot of pain and stuff, as you know, because you've interviewed a lot of people. Right. It was never fun. It was, you know, it described some of the monks. It was, it was a burning. It was, a, it was, you know, they, it was always not fun words they used. No, and, and it was a forced transcendence in order to, to be okay with what they were going through yeah. and to bring the mind to a state of uh, the same thing, of just doing what's in front of you to do in that moment and letting mm -hmm. everything else go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I think we don't teach this. And we, I think if we did, the whole issue of world peace would be a lot easier to achieve, wouldn't it? <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that topic here in just a minute. I want to ask you something. I, I'm an educator as well. From, um, I taught high school for a number of years and, and some college. Um, what I ended up doing, I, I taught at multiple high schools, special ed, regular ed, uh, charter schools. I was in full charge of a curriculum at two different schools. And then I wrote a business plan afterward to include all the things I saw was missing and missing in a holistic model. Mm. And one of the first things that I saw that we don't do that, for instance, the Russians do is there's an assessment of the student, their aptitude, their attitude, their proclivities. We don't do that. We just put them into a box and say, okay, here's what you're going to do. And that's a disservice because there's so much, and, and John Cleet, we, I was in uh, Las Vegas last week for a Freedom Fest event. And John Cleese was one of the main speakers one night. And his talk was on creativity and that how he had learned growing up that nobody ever mentioned creativity until he was 22, <laughs> right? And then he you know, started looking at, okay, what is creativity? And in the fact that, uh, his talk was that he'd written a manuscript uh, or a presentation and lost it. So then the next morning he had to rewrite it from memory. And once he, and then he found the old one and he compared the two and the second version was far better than the first. <laughs> what it led him to recognize and, and test was that uh, as far as the, the span of it was that creative people know how to hit the pause button and just walk away and then come back. And most of them, you know, essentially learn how they can program their mind before going to sleep. And they take the challenge to bed with them and wake up in the morning with an answer. Yeah. Right. And it just flows. And so yeah. there's, that gives the opportunity for realization that we have all that information inside of us we just need to allow it to emerge and we got to figure yeah. out a way to do such which falls into the realms of discipline mm. and i think this is exactly what you're talking about being able to just focus and, and allow those things to come forth which they do automatically when you're able to um put the engine in neutral yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and i think uh you know letting go of letting go is such an important piece of the journey because i look at the mistakes i've made in my life and i made a lot of mistakes some big ones that have just cost me almost my life and, I, I think we all do you know so well I, not all of us but those that reach this level of understanding and work at this kind of level with others we've all had our excruciatingly fun experiences <laughs> right yeah right and uh it's one of the things on innovate talking about creativity and innovation around uh this entrepreneurial thing as i'm doing this research it uh in, we we have been conned into thinking that becoming a great leader you have to do these things and the things are usually written by an author who was never there but if they were there they would have seen the pain and they would have seen the mistakes and they would have seen all those things which created this person to be a leader right. and that's the honing of the metal yeah yeah i know sam walton's interview i i, I read about was this journalist was like how do you 
how do you how did you do it sam you created the most powerful empire you know in retail and all and he kept saying you know i made a lot of mistakes and this wrong and as we know he keeps drilling like what how did how did you how did you do it sam i mean really what was it that what was the magic bullet what was it he says okay it was it was, it was from experience and so the journalist is like finally we're getting somewhere how did you get the experience sam? And, and he responds i keep telling you i made a lot of mistakes <laughs> And so that's, that's, that's it. Well, right. And, and that therein is another point. When we ask the question, we really need to listen intently because oftentimes we're, we're pushing or pulling energy in order to try to find something that we think we're looking for instead of actually allowing that topic, that answer, that opportunity to emerge naturally. And like we were talking earlier, in a synchronistic event, we just don't yeah. recognize those, let alone pay attention to them. We ward them off as, synchron as coincidences, you know, yeah. they're random stuff when they're really not. They're yeah. part of a series of thoughts and actions and attentions and intentions and interactions that then evolve to this presentation, if you will, that just yeah. takes time. And, and sometimes that takes 10 years, could take 20, could take decades, could take a lifetime, depending on the question that you start out with, right? Yep, yep. And I think that's, uh, was a Carl Jung meaningful coincidence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and they do happen. And, and is there any, uh, speaking of, is there any um, wish, desire, prayers that you may have had at some point that years later actually manifested as an opportunity for you that you didn't recognize maybe in the moment but then you know moving on and looking back you saw the connectedness well it's interesting i uh only recently have been diagnosed with adhd <laughs> and uh, looking back on it i never knew that i had it but and I could tell why I was doing certain things now. It, it explained a lot. Sure. And some things I was doing was irritating to people. And, and I didn't know why I was doing it either. But it's, well, why do we, what do you think we, we call those things uh, syndromes or deficits or disorder. whatever? Because it, it's, it isn't structured in how we've been used to receiving things. And, and it could be a part of our own evolution where we're able to just have attention on more things than one simultaneously. Well, the, that, I think that's, and actually it's in the book too, because uh, in this new uh, entrepreneur book that I'm writing, because I was looking at these entrepreneurs and most of them have ADHD. Mm -hmm. And what we began to realize, and a lot of researchers confirm this, that um, it, it may be something necessary to evolve civilization or companies, or organizations. It's a higher functional mind, in my opinion. Yeah, Dr. John Gartner wrote uh, Hypomania, an interesting book. He's uh, he's here in Baltimore, and, and I, I know him personally. And um, he went through to look at these these explorers, these people that have impacted us over time, and did a, a psychological diagnosis to show that there was a combination of things going on that we would classify as disorders. But then the question is, if people didn't have these disorders, would we have left any of our tribes where we have tried to branch out into new realms where we have evolved. And so um, the conclusion seems to be coming to no, it has to be a person that is that is willing to take those risks mm -hmm. naturally mm -hmm. or and think, not necessarily be more intelligent, but can think 700 times faster. And even though that can be an asset when you're innovating and creating or, uh, you know, shifting a civilization, but it, it's a disaster when it comes to relationships. Yeah. You know, right. and, and unless so, you find another that, that can vibe with you. Now, do you find that, uh, which, you know, sometimes it, they come from across the world as you and I both have experienced. Right. Um, and, and that's part of, of I think this. Uh, so here's a question I'm going to ask. Um, in your discoveries, do you see a kind of natural evolutionary process that's emerging that allows us to have that higher minded faculty? And 
more ease of connectedness with information that's not present yet that becomes available because of our ability to be in such a state. Yes, and it's a it's a pattern that's been going on for thousands of years, and and it's not the answer that I ever thought it would be. But the answer, the answer was business, hmm. mercantilism, commerce, trade, and trade. This, yeah, trade exactly because and and this it came it hit me in the face when I read that book. You, I don't know, you probably read Guns, Germs, and Steel. Hmm. Guns, Germs, and Steel, this, uh, this researcher brilliantly connected the dots on, on race and why did the white race become so much more dominant? And he was asked this by a tribesman somewhere and he couldn't figure it out because there's really nothing different in our genetics, but it ended up being real estate. <laughs> it's like whoever was going to be, and he, in, the, in the book, it's very complicated, he puts right. it like, Whoever was standing in this space that had uh, domestic crops, domestic animals that could create more calories per acre so we could fund scientists, philosophers, teachers, all that, they were probably going to do well. And those that weren't in that space or in other spaces is another area. But the other thing we was talking about was commerce, mercantilism, trade, because mm -hmm. guess where ideas come from? the interchange, the interplace between cultures and, yep. you know, exchanging money for value, but in, but then we're having a relationship. And then it's like, well, tell me more about what you learned or what did you discover? So it's- And, how, and there's, that's where the improvements come in and the innovation and what can we do better and how do we do right. this? You know, there's also uh, another side, there's apparently a genetic aspect of this and there's a, and you'll love this. There's a Russian academian named Valentina Morovna and her dissertation was on the, she calls it the genetic mutation in humanity. And she's got two degrees, I think, in microbiology and astrophysics. Um, and of course, ac the academian label in, in the Russian uh, society is their top scientific um, title. So mm -hmm. she gives this dissertation uh, it's in Russian, but it has English subtitles. My wife actually found it and, and thought I would love it. And because she says a lot of the same things that we're talking about, only she's found some scientific evidence from it that she offers. And that through this process, we are becoming a new, not necessarily a new species, but a, a higher being of effective interaction because we understand naturally this interconnectedness that we've been, it's the inside, you know, we live half inside and half outside. Most of this, especially with what we're talking about now, the business, the trade, the, the mercantilism, that's an outer activity. Well, what fuels that? And right. that's the inner activity that most of us are bereft of having, let alone acknowledging and having those kinds of intimate conversations that says, hey, you know, I'm feeling this way about that. This just happened. Yeah. I think I lost you. Global peace movement. And how do we do this? How do we allow this naturally emergent quality of people wanting to come together, especially right. after COVID and, and the pandemic, because we were taught through the media narrative that we need to be afraid of each other, you know, obsessed on self hygiene, sequestration, and all that kind of stuff. And that actually got people to turn inward because that's yeah. the natural behavior mod of that kind of activity, right? So now we're having this emergence of these people that are questing for something greater, not only within themselves, but within their communities and how they can better serve and you know, all the kinds of opportunities that are available, which allows the, the idea of peace to come forth again. And then, mm -hmm. okay, now what do we need to do in order to create the opportunities on an individual community, uh, city, state, regional, national, level and you know the elephant in the room is the legal and legislative side of things that have allowed um, aggression to take place mm. 
right? And those are the right. things that we need to eliminate in order for peace to emerge. The other side of it, that's the live side of live and let live. The let live side is as long as you're not an aggressor, you're free to live however you so choose as long, you know, not even as long as you're happy. You're just free to live however you choose. I have no right to tell you how to live or what to do or that I can make suggestions, right? But it's your choice and I need to accept that. You're the iron-fisted dictator of your body, your mind, your money, your property, your thoughts, your love, whatever that is. And that seems to be you know, kind of a, it's almost a restatement of the old, you know, do to others what you'd have them do to you kind of thing. So do you see that kind of resurgence of ancient philosophy um, coming forth and, and being available for um, some kind of, of maybe not short-term, but long-term results in the next 10, 15, maybe generation or so? Oh, yeah. I mean, look at the uh, upswelling of people in meditation courses, yoga courses. So now we're studying Stoicism. Everything is, you know, what about, what about the Stoics? I mean, what, what the, where'd that come from? Yeah, it's, it's, right. it's, it's this explosion. But a lot of it is because we've had, we have exchange of value. You know, it comes back to mercantilism again. Mm -hmm. For instance, if, if India had no trade outside of India and there was a wall around it, we want to know what yoga meant. Right. Which is not, would not be an issue. It was like, I don't know what that, we would never, we had no communication. They're inside this place. I don't know who they are. I heard they may be there, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so so I what I hear you saying is that diversity is what makes the difference. It, it, what, it's what creates that capacity for unification. Yeah. Getting access to it. Yeah. You know, and, um, here's an example. I, I was in, in a deep Himalayan region and I, I kicked myself for not buying these, this set of Buddhist prayer beads, hmm. this heavy Buddhist region. And, you know, we get a chance to interact with villagers and things like that. So I, I fly back and I'm like, you know, I, I really, I don't feel like taking a month off to go back on an expedition into this region to get the freaking pair of prayer beads. So I was disappointed. Okay. A month later, it's Christmas. I'm in New York city at this intersection where they have all these booths set up. I forget which, it's park, and I forget. Anyway, if you're in New York City, you know, on Christmas, it's all these booths set up. And I walk by, and there's the freaking prayer beads hanging up in this Tibetan woman's stall. And I said, where the hell did you get those? And she said, well, my son, he, he's in the border of Bhutan, and so he had, he, so he sent Same village. Over. I'm like, Pff. Okay, so that's the example I was talking about earlier, right? You had the regret for not getting them. So some part of you intentionally wanted to have them and you put it out to the universe and you just happened to be walking by this booth that there they were, right? So was that an, a, another part of you that was managing that whole scenario that you were unaware of? And imagine, and here's the, that, that's the first part of the question. And if you were aware of that, process more intimately could you repeat it more regularly that's a good question i i would like to think i was powerful enough to cause tibetan u.s mercantile exchange <laughs> and that's why her sons sold her the bees but i think it, i think it was a meaningful coincidence i think she was going to have those beads whether or not i regretted not buying them in the himalayas well sure and, but look at where okay but uh, from your own personal experience, right? Rather than show up anyplace else, you walked in front of that booth with those beads. Yeah. Now, and yes, I agree. It could have been a meaningful coincidence, but when we start peeling back the layers and looking at the interactive qualities that we actually have, even the quantum physics model that um, Ed Close and, and Vernon Neppe presented in 2010, the, he, they posited that consciousness, space, and time are tethered across nine dimensions for the human experience. Doesn't exclude other dimensions, just that we're limited to these nine. Well, how do those nine interact? And mm -hmm. what's on each one of those dimensions? What kind of thoughts do we have? What kind of bodies are there? Uh, and when we begin to become aware of those through an experience that you know may happen by happenstance or by meaningful coincidence, uh, or through meditation, or through sheer 
quest for the experience of them, which a lot of people found in the 70s, 60s and 70s through the psychotropics, th those doors open, right? Mm -hmm. And there's now a lot of medical proof that, yeah, even those doors opening to those psychotropics can facilitate healing in people that have tried all kinds of other methods and weren't able to do so. So th these are kinds of things that, you know, from a, a, a greater science perspective of the constructs of reality that we're beginning to to understand it, Moreau, when it gets gets into these things, Nepi and Close get into them. Um, the you know the spiral dynamics model kind of puts those also in a nine level framework of the understanding of the individual and how they ascend to a, a understanding of oneness and service. Let's say at a top tier level, and you know then at the very you know survivalist state with at, at the lowest lowest level. And the solfeggio tones are the same way. There's nine of those that seem to kind of correlate to that nine dimensional framework. Well, these are, you know, just discoveries that have happened in the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. So how do we, you know, Gardner stuff was around from 82 and we still haven't incorporated the multiple intelligence idea in the educational system. Yeah. So these things take time. Right. Does take time. I mean, like uh, Hopkins right down the street. I mean, they just published this past year the, you know, the use of uh, you know psilocybin as a way to cure depression. I mean, right. and remarkable. But how how long did that take? You know, it um, it, it you know it takes almost a. Um, well, it depends on here. Here's where where I believe, at least, and from my experience, would would tend to correlate with it. Those are non-linear, non-local moments right because we're, we're set up as linear beings for the most part that's how we've been taught to think and be and do and act and all that kind of stuff well these kinds of things happen in a non-linear and, and sometimes non-local environment so how do we acquiesce to being able to enter those kinds of frameworks and, and have you found something that works from that perspective in the work that you're doing I think it uh, for all of us on the journey. I, I find that uh, the reaching the emptiness is a place to begin to allow it to occur. Mm -hmm. But on the outside world, to say how do we apply this? Then it takes time because then you need proof. You know, there because people believe me. There's people that create stuff where it's like really. Yep. You know, I mean, I don't know. So, like I was at a bar somewhere and somebody was uh, pontificating. What about a triple helix instead of a double helix? And I'm like, well, what about NA, RNA transcription? How does that occur? Right. In a, in a, in a, totally, I couldn't answer the question. I never thought about it. But right. it was a neat idea. Or how does right? hydrogen relate? You know, yeah. you've got the Trinity model that's pretty much in everything from the, the atom on, on up, but there's one thing that's missing, and that's hydrogen. You know, hydrogen fuels the sun. It's the most prevalent gas in the universe, and it's our bonding agent for our DNA, speaking of. So is it possible that there's a transmission of consciousness through that too? That's what that gets into. Yeah. What happened to the Big Bang? And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We've gone for another couple of hours on, on that that area. So it's it's interesting. The journey, I think, is personal uh, when you get into some of these dimensions, which is uh, but if you can if you can replicate it and you can define it and and measure it, then it, it's easier. To have everyone say, "Let's apply this." Right. Like, now, is like, that measurement um, numerical, or is it experiential? Because there are the similarities of experience that you can denote as evidence and proof. Yeah, if, if it's a measurable experiential effect, absolutely. Like meditation is an example. Right. Guess everybody's heart rate went down, blood pressure went down. That's all measurable work. The rest is really an internal journey, and I think we get I think we get hung up because if we have that in the internal side, how do I give it to you? There was a Tao, and I, I struggle with it my, myself because I struggle like how how can we take some of these epiphanies, these these mystical insights, and make it more like the new normal, right? And yeah. uh, this Tao was phrased was uh, if someone I think I've got this right if someone asks about the Tao, and the other one answers neither of them know absolutely I, I totally get with that and speaking of the Tao, yin and yang but okay the the two-dimensional model 
and I got this idea from watching Contact and how they took that two-dimensional schematic and, and turn it into a three-dimensional piece that then they were able to create the machines from. So is it possible, and I'm, I'm simply looking at, okay, I, I know that in the firing system, there's lights on and lights off. There's yes, no, there's on, off. And that's how our uh, neurocircuitry works in, in the pulses that go through it. Is it possible that two-dimensional model of the yin and yang is actually a cross section from a top down view of a DNA helix with one side with the light on and one side with the light off. That's a good question. <laughs> right? Because everything's about spin. And that's yeah. how that's how the energy moves through us is, is what direction is it spinning? Is it, uh, you know, is it exploding or imploding? And, and do how do we catch it in between? Right? Which is kind of where we're at. We're the physical part of that integration between the inner and outer realities that we experience. Well, the new developments, which I'm excited to see now that we're starting to experience the new level of instead of on off computing, uh, the quantum computing, right, which is now being harnessed and now being developed. And now we're starting to see, you know, horizons on products that could use that brings in a whole nother different calculation. Uh, so there will be a non-binary episode, but when you look at the quantum levels of molecules and you look at brain synapses, is what is what's going on there? Is it is the synapse really on or off or is there a transitional energy state? Is there something that's exactly. still a, a, a probability wave going back to Schrodinger's cat? Right. <laughs> and, uh, Are you that, waving or have you condensed into a point? Right. Yeah. So it it's we don't know yet, right? We just yeah. no. All we know is what we're experiencing, and then we die. So um, I think it's worth exploring, but but it's almost like there's a there's the inner journey, like I said, where I can't tell you, or I don't know what it is if I did, because the Tao phrase, and then there's the external, which is well, wait a minute, this is something that we can have some measurement about. So if we're saying that this can tra change our brain configuration, great, let's take a photograph mm -hmm. and then see if it changed. Right. You know, I wonder if, if Lipton has done that kind of thing, because he's a proponent of you we're able to change our DNA by how we think, you know, by the choices that we have. And, and maybe that's true, maybe it isn't, but it, it does affect how we live and, and the experience we have depending on the perception and, and the pers uh, perspective that we have of life. Now, do you, um, talking about consciousness, have you considered or, or are you, do you think that there's a possibility that we are, that each of us as human beings are an individuated form of cosmic consciousness that is condensed into a specific unit, so to speak? Of well, potentially having a, a perfected form, fit, and function in the world, going back to that question about design. Yeah, there's been an, enough, I think, quantitative measurement on that interconnectivity, uh, whether it was the remote sensing that uh, Target put off had to release back in 1977. That got squelched, but it was published in the IEEE. Ingo Swan and Lynn Buchanan and those guys. It was all about remote sensing. And yeah. so that says something. Carl Jung, very explicit on super consciousness and how it projects down into this reality. Um, we look at some of the brain scans around, like I love the work John Kabat-Zinn did at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center where, you know, we the, uh, uh, Zen meditation produced the same brain pattern in the scans as medicated people. They couldn't tell the difference between medication and meditation. So it's like, well, what does this mean, right? And well, maybe so, that's all, of, you know, that, that gives um, credence to self-medication, right? No, yeah. <laughs> and, and it, <laughs> so the thing is, is, you know, once we get to the point of measurement, then it gets more interesting. Yeah. Because until then, it's a philosophy, which means it could be true or not. But in that sense, it's what's inside, because you're never going to be able to get it out of you into someone else until they experience it. So I'm interested in seeing how the quantum work is being developed now because we're starting to get in touch with interconnectivity, 
um, and I and time, you know, moving backwards and forwards. What we see as time and space is is changing, you know, as we mm -hmm. get more and more into that. But do you think that because of that understanding that we're actually being able to explore more of those interdimensional frameworks and maybe find out how those interact with one another from a frequency resonance perspective? Because it's all yeah. based on, on the frequencies, right? The, the, the higher you go, and, and even Dr. Laszlo has done some work on this, is that really that top frame is a very high pitched almost the, the hindus call it the shabda mm -hmm. right you're familiar with it the, which is a collection of all the life form vibrations on the planet that produces one tone that is extremely high pitched and they call it the sound current mm -hmm. shabda is their word um, but those kinds of things are, are this again um, ancient philosophies coming out now that science is starting to show we're actually true so the evidence like, like you're speaking we're able to quantify and qualify those kinds of things now the the trick is to make it uh repeatable and prolific yeah and that's happening i mean look at entanglement you know i mean that came out relatively recently and now it's like wow that changes our understanding of nature it's where when two particles are uh in a relationship with each other you can separate them and what happens to this particle affects this particle right and they can be at the other ends of the universe now let's take that to another level of how um innovation takes place and there's usually at least three people on the planet that have the same idea simultaneously could that be an aspect of entanglement from one of those other dimensional perspectives you know well then you have to be able to show I mean, it could be from a number of things. For instance, if you believe in Jungian synchronicity, we're all the same person. So obviously you get at the same thought <laughs> as I've had. Right. Um, from a molecular point of view, you'd have to be able to take entanglement and then be able to see how it affects uh, neural functioning to say, well, if I'm, a, if I'm spinning this this way, it's going to affect in the brain that way. And that person's going to have an experience that can be measured. We're, I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't either, but uh, these kinds of questions, I think, are, are valid. And, yeah. you know, from stepping back and being able to observe it from a hypothetical standpoint, mm -hmm. that, yeah, this looks like it could be possible. Now, what are the, how do we, how do we unpack it and ask better questions about it? Yeah. And this is where I don't, I mean, they're smarter people than me, but some of the questions I have, like, if the, if the Big Bang this hydrogen thing came out and it splintered and then stars formed and formed higher density molecules like we have in our bodies came out of a star at some point right because that's how fusion could take and you know, if and, we and, really and, recognize and, not to interrupt but i just i want to add on something i think is necessary our bodies are actually mother earth all the nutrients all the cells all the material that we have we got from our planet in right. some way shape or form and we don't think about that and someday we got to give it back. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe so, uh, we're just borrowing. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe there there are some folks who throughout history, and, and there have been more than one that has been identified that actually took their bodies with them. Um, that's you know a, a, a discipline that is far beyond anything we're at right now. Uh, but there might be you know isolated incidents of that where people have stayed free of the outer accoutrements that keep us locked in here mm -hmm. so in the the moving forward i guess how what might you offer to the individual who's been listening to to this and and granted we have had just an amazing conversation and went on all kinds of different directions with very practical and pragmatic information i might add uh, and I thank you for that. It's a joy to speak with someone that can talk at that level. Um, thank you. You're welcome. And so what kind of, you know, practical advice or, or activity might you share with our audience that would give them um, the ability to step into that emptiness that we've been talking about? Well, I think the, the path is already been laid out if you look at the the ancient mystics i mean you can go into the 
ancient mystical Christianity or Buddhism. I mean, the whole thing on suffering was about reaching the emptiness. And so um, I don't know if I can improve on that at all. But and I, I can't say that I actually do a good job of doing it myself. But I do know that in between thought, there's there's a space. And in that space is where you have the emptiness. And from there, creation, ideas, you know, people you were describing people go to sleep and they can they set themselves up for some solution that that occurs so i think there's a lot that goes on in our consciousness but i i uh, can't really improve on what's been done so far around achieving that emptiness but there are a lot of people smarter than i that talk about you know when they're in the zone and when they're i mean there's some great people out there some of you probably have interviewed already uh but that's what i would recommend keep keep searching but keep empty, keep learning, and don't be afraid to die when you have to commit suicide to an old belief that's no longer serving you. Like, what in your life has to die for you to get to the next level? And ultimately, if I'm hearing you correctly, and, and how, you know, we've been kind of talking around the whole aspect of love, right? Because that's the freedom. When you're, when you're totally free to express and receive and... Uh, and so that gives that's the the emptiness that we seek and, and you know we it's been said i don't know if this is quantifiable or not or, or how it was quantified but we've got seventy thousand thoughts a day right mm -hmm. and how do we manage that how do we pay, start paying attention to the activity of our mind in, in order to start to quiet it and and be able to find those moments of quietness and emptiness in between um, yeah. how, how how do you do that to find those moments it's uh i i stuck at it quite frankly i have my my brain's going on so so quickly I it's the adhd know. right yeah i don't know <laughs> i'm gonna make a little bit of adderall or uh or meditation if, if, which is a harder struggle for me to get to i don't know if i'm the best uh, uh expert to talk to about that um, but I, but I find that if you're, when I'm in the zone, um, for me, um, and I'm, I stop thinking because I'm just in the zone of learning, uh, then I'm no longer, I'm no longer sufficient or significant in the process. And it's in that insignificance that I can discover something or it discovers me. And then I try to see, is that useful that I could teach? Mm -hmm. Interesting you make the, the juxtaposition there because that's true. Sometimes we discover it more often than not, it discovers us. We just mm -hmm. become aware of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. So cool. my whole philosophy in life is to learn, teach, and die. And that's it. Yeah. Well, and if you didn't have to die, what would that be like? Right? Well, yeah. Well, for me, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like to do a, what's the Buddhist term? Die a hundred death, thousand deaths. I, there's a, uh, I'd like to die a hundred times a day. Yeah. Part of me is dying and yeah. something new is being born. So and yeah, sometimes to die is to live. You know, by by dying that thousand or hundred or thousand times or however many times necessary actually empowers the living. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now do I want to take my body with me? I don't know. I think I'd rather check it in for a new one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll allow that. All right, Don, it has been such a pleasure talking with you. Um, I've gone way over my normal time, and, and I thank you for being willing to do that. It, it's, been, uh, it's been enjoyable. Time's flown. Um, yeah. Evidently, we stepped into that dimensional doorway where time disappeared for a while. Yes, we did. <laughs> yeah. no, well, thank you. I appreciate you and inter your interview. Uh, you're doing some great work, so I love being part of it in some small way. Thank you. You're very welcome. And namaste and in la catch. And thank you all for staying with us through this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host, and I will see you next time. <laughs>